As you do, please take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. We're going to be focusing on verses 1 to 7 there in our time together. And if you're a guest with us, let me just say as well, uh, we are glad to have you. Our typical practice as a church on Sunday mornings is to make our way through a book of the Bible. And so we've been preaching our way the last few months. It's been a privilege to work our way slowly through this wonderful book of Philippians. And we finished chapter 2 last week, so that's why we're picking up the beginning of chapter 3 today. Philippians 3, verses 1 to 7. And this is the living and active Word of God that's speaking to us today. Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God in glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. May the Lord help us do the same today. Well, I'm always fascinated to learn about animal behaviors. It's just, uh, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of all the different ways that God has hardwired into his creation, survival techniques and social relationships. It's, it's just fascinating to learn. And, and recently, one strategy that I read about was interesting. It's called aggressive mimicry. Aggressive mimicry. And aggressive mimicry is this. It's a deception where a predator will camouflage himself so that it looks like something that's necessary. It'll look like something that's necessary for its prey's survival. could be something as basic as imitating the food of its prey. Uh, and then the goal is when the hunter uses this disguise to lure in it's an unsuspecting meal, and tries to get it close enough to strike. And that's when the predator pounces. The very last thing that the prey sees is an ambush coming out of the place where it least expected it. So in the animal world, matters of survival come down to being able to discern the difference between what's truly beneficial and what's also a malicious pretender. That's a matter of life and death. In the passage this morning, Paul is highlighting a sort of spiritual, aggressive mimicry. It's a kind of predator which can blend into the life of a church really easily. It uses a respectable form, really, to draw us in, and then it strikes without warning. And it's this subtle danger of legalism. Subtle danger of legalism. Paul's determined, he's determined to point it out as the true spiritual danger that it poses. Whether it slithers in its way, through false teaching, or it lurks in the recesses of our very own hearts. This is a danger. Paul is saying this is a danger that we must identify and fight at every turn. The danger of legalism. So that's why Paul includes this section. He wants to shine a bright light on this topic so that we can see it clearly. And remember, this warning is written to Christians. It's written to the Philippian church. So these are folks who get the gospel. And if that's the case... The question then comes, well, why? Why does he think this is so crucial? Why is this such an important warning? Why do they need to know about the danger of legalism yet again? Well, the answer is there in verse 1. Look at that. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me. And why? It is safe for you. It's safe for you. That's why he includes this, for their joy and for their protection. That's why this section is here. And he singles out two primary areas where this danger of legalism is exposed, where you can find it, where you can see it. 
It's seen in warped gospel proclamation. That's where legalism shows up, in warped gospel proclamation. And we can recognize it in a desire to be justified by works, self-justification. Those are the two places. If you want to look in those two places, it blends in really easily. But if you were to try to discern the difference and try to understand the difference, those are the two places where you can start to see it show up. You can start to see real stripes of what legalism actually is, as opposed to the authentic thing. And he warns them against warped gospel proclamation. That's in verses 2 and 3. And then in verses 4 to 7, he's going to challenge this desire that's inside of us for self-justification. Those are our two points this morning. Watch out for anything that twists the gospel, any teaching that twists the gospel, and watch out for this desire inside of you that desires to justify itself. So those are our two points. So we first want to take a closer look at this, what this warped gospel entails. Paul is painfully aware. He knows there's a certain sect of Jews known as the Judaizers, and they've gone out preaching a message very, very similar to Paul's. They have preached Jesus as the Christ. They told of his death and resurrection. And they even agree with Paul on the need for faith. They're in agreement on those things. So on the surface, it appears they're saying the same thing. But that was the problem. That was a problem all along. They only added one seemingly minor requirement. And in fact, it, from a logical perspective, it, it makes sense. Here's what they added. Gentiles should accept circumcision. Gentiles should accept circumcision. And like I said, this, this would have made sense in their time. It would have made a lot of sense. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't somebody who's converting from a pagan city like Philippi accept the sign of God's people? Why shouldn't that be a requirement? Wouldn't it make it a little bit easier to kind of fold them in with their Jewish brothers and sisters? Wouldn't that be a remove a stumbling block? It just, it just makes logical sense. So at first glance, this didn't feel like a big deal. Why not tell the Gentiles they need to be circumcised when they convert to Christianity? But Paul sounds the alarm. He sounds the alarm specifically over this teaching. He recognizes it immediately as a warped gospel. Adding anything, even something that looks good, even something that makes logical sense, to the message of Jesus Christ is going to defile it. That's what he saw. It's a similar picture to what God had, had said in Exodus 20, where he says to the Israelites, if you make me an altar of stone, if you're coming to me and you make an altar of stone, you shall not build it out of hewn stones, out of stones that were cut. For if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. That's what the Judaizers were doing. By taking out their hammer and adding one small chisel mark, to the chief cornerstone that God had laid down, they were, in fact, in fact, profaning the whole thing. That's what Paul saw. And he uses shocking language to try to help them see the same thing, to drive home that truth. He uses three different warnings to increasingly show the teaching of the Judaizers is actually a complete reversal of God's plan. It's a complete reversal of God's plan. First, he tells the Philippians to watch out for the dogs. You have to understand a little bit of the culture to understand how blunt that kind of language is. Dogs were, in the ancient world, they were not man's best friend. There wasn't like a pet coal on every corner in Rome. Dogs were mangy. They were dirty scavengers. They were considered unclean. And so many of the Jews who looked down on the Gentiles as pagans would call them Gentile dogs. That's how they viewed them. Well, Paul is now reversing that description. And he's using the exact same language to describe these teachers of circumcision. He says, those people are actually the real dogs to watch out for. And then he uses an even stronger label. He calls them evil workers. You see that second warning there in verse 2? He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. This is not a separate group of people that he's introducing here. These are the same folks that he's just labeled as the dogs. And the circumcision that they're parading around as a good and necessary work, Paul is saying that's actually a work of evil. It's actually what that is. And as shocking as that statement is, the third image may be the most jolting. He finishes verse 2 by saying, look out. This is the third warning. They're in a row. The third warning, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. This would have been the most stunning language for the original hearers. 
Back then, people used self-mutilation mutilation as a form of worshiping false gods and idols. It's possible that even some members of this church in Philippi had come from an idol-worshiping background. They may have actually had scars from demonic rituals and ceremonies. So this phrase would have brought to their minds, it would have brought to their minds the most graphic images of paganism possible. That's the terms that Paul is laying out in this false teaching. And Paul is applying that same label to these Judaizers who are warping the gospel by adding a simple requirement. Placing anything on top of the gospel, even something that looks helpful, that makes sense. Paul says, this is shocking, they are in fact serving Satan himself. It's about as strong a statement as he could have made. Legalism pretends to be for Christ, pretends to be for the gospel, but if you look close enough, you can start to see through the veneer. There's a spirit of Antichrist behind it. And Paul is determined that they're able to see that for themselves. One of my favorite 20th century theologians, his name is J. Gresham Machen. I never knew how to say that name. J. Gresham Machen explains it this way. And he, and he explains it. He helps us see what's really at stake. Why Paul is using such shocking language. Why is he trying to drive this point home so much? Here's what he says to identify what's at stake here. Surely Paul ought to have made common cause with teachers who were so nearly in agreement with him. Surely he ought to have applied to them the great principle of Christian unity. As a matter of fact, however, Paul did nothing of the kind. And only because he and others did nothing of the kind does the Christian church exist today. Paul saw very clearly the difference between the Judaizers and himself was the difference between two entirely distinct types of religion. It was the difference between a religion of merit and a religion of grace. If Christ provides only part of our salvation, leaving us to provide the rest, then we are still hopeless under the load of sin. For no, no matter how small the gap which must be bridged before salvation can be attained... The awakened conscience sees clearly that our wretched attempt at goodness is insufficient to even bridge that gap. The guilty soul enters again into the hopeless reckoning with to determine whether we have really done our part. And thus we groan again under the old bondage of the law. Such an attempt, get this, such an attempt to piece out the work of Christ by our own merit, Paul saw clearly is the very essence of unbelief. Christ will do everything or nothing. And the only hope is to throw ourselves unreservedly on his mercy and trust him, him for all. Paul knew the gospel plus is no gospel at all. And we don't have to look very far in church history to see the destruction that this teaching causes. The warped gospel was what Martin Luther grew up living and breathing in the 1500s. He didn't deny Jesus' identity. He didn't deny his death and resurrection. He, he also believed, though, that he had to do a little bit of a part. He had to bridge this gap. And Luther, like Paul, recognized that God's law was good and right. And so he grew up his entire life attempting to obey it with all his might. He tried as much as he could. He became a monk. He went to confession multiple times a day. He used to beat himself to try to pay for his sins. He even boldly posted the, the, the famous 95 theses that we know that called out some of the false teaching and the corruptions that he saw in the Catholic Church. Yet the more he tried, the heavier his burden became. And every effort only caused more anxiety and resentment inside of him because every effort only served to entangle him more, to show how much he was in the grip of sin. And as a result, this warped gospel, his life became increasingly miserable. It was a vicious cycle that was spiraling downward. But one day, 1519, Luther was meditating on Romans 1, 16 to 17, which talks about how the righteousness of God is offered as a free gift in the gospel. And in that moment, it clicked for him. The righteousness of God was to be received as a gift. 
Here's how he described that moment in his life. I love his words. Meditating on that, and here's when it clicked, here's how he described it. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. There, a totally, there in that verse, a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. That revelation is what unleashed, that revelation to Luther getting the gospel alone is what unleashed the Protestant Reformation. And that's why the Reformers in their day were so adamant that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. They wanted to preserve that true gospel from all the counterfeits, from all the warped versions. Listen, the gospel reveals that the full requirements, this is what it reveals, the full requirements, everything of the law were accomplished 2,000 years ago by God the Son in our place. That's what the Gospels are teaching us. As we read them, that's the record that all the laws look like in the flesh. The entire debt of sin that we owed was fully paid in our place. Christ's bodily resurrection is proof of both of those things, that both of those things are true. That's the wonderful news to be received as a gift through faith. Christ has done it all. Christ has done it all. And it's no different in our day than it was for Paul or it was for Luther. We have to be on our guard against any teaching that usurps this gospel message. Twist it just a little bit. It may reference Jesus. It may sound good. But if you peel back the layers, ultimately what you're going to find is gospel plus something. It merges moralism and this Christian message, and it tries to create a third option for humanity. It tries to create a third way. Listen, that's an extremely dangerous option to allow in. That kind of thinking. It isn't biblical. In Scripture, there's only two. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either under grace or you're under the law. Totally. You're either under one or you're under the other. And the only difference, the only difference between those two groups is the gospel. That's the only difference. Notice how Paul only allows for two options here. Look at, this, look at verse 3. He's only allowing for two options. You can, you can either be in this camp, or here's, that's what verse 2 was, or in verse 3, here's your other option. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and get this, and put no confidence in the flesh. That's what marks those who are truly God's people. They worship God by the Spirit. They glory in Christ Jesus. But it isn't only those two things that mark the people of God. Listen, you could possibly have those two things and still try to figure out a way to chart a third way, this third option. But just to be especially clear, Paul shuts that down. So he adds this one final phrase to totally and finally rule out a third way. There is no third category. The true circumcision are those who put no confidence in the flesh. Christians are those who put no confidence in the flesh. There is no Christian who only sort of needs Jesus. And those are the categories we're trying to... Sometimes we have categories in our mind. There, there are those who are lost. They're sinners. There are those Christians who really needed Jesus, and then there's the Christians who only, they're pretty good, and they only sort of needed Christians. They only sort of needed Jesus. There are no sort of needed Jesus Christians. Paul sees that third option kind of being promoted. And he says, be on your guard against that. Watch out for that. That's gospel plus teaching. It may look righteous, it may look safe, but underneath, it's a demonic mimicry that at best is going to destroy your joy in Christ, and at worst, it's going to ravage your church. So that's the first warning. Watch out for a warped gospel proclamation. But the danger of legalism doesn't just reside out there somewhere in the form of false teaching. Legalism also resides in here. It resides in our hearts. It shows up in this inner desire to justify ourselves. And Paul's saying he shifts gears. He shifts gears from talking about the Judaizers in verse 2 and 3. Now he's talking about a legalism which inherently resides inside each of us. 
because we can intellectually agree with that. We can agree with everything that he's just said. The theological argument that he's just made, we can give assent to and say, absolutely, I agree with that. <clears throat> and yet at the same time, we can functionally remain blind to this sinful tendency in our own hearts that's still there. And so in love, that's exactly what he wants to help us be able to identify in our own lives. He wants us to be able to see that in ourselves. And he points to one specific tendency that allows us to see legalism in our hearts in the clearest form, in the purest form. This is the easiest way to see it in your hearts. And it's a tendency the Judaizers often used. It's this tendency that we all have to compare ourselves favorably and to look down on others. A tendency to compare ourselves favorably and to look down on others. Look at verse 4 with me. He says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anybody's tempted, if anybody wants to think he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's about to lay out a brilliant argument. This is about as brilliant an argument as you can find. It's insane. He, he pulls up a chair. It's like he's pulling up a chair. He said, all right, we're playing the comparison game. That's great. Let me in. Deal me in. If we're going to play a comparison game, come away from the rookie table and let's talk. Name the game and I'll beat you. I don't even know what's in your hand, and I bet my background before Christ is going to trump whatever you got in yours. Look at the credentials that he piles, one on top of another, in verses 5 and 6. It's a remarkable onslaught. It just keeps coming. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Almost the, the, the implication is, were you? Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, should I go on? A Hebrew of Hebrews. Listen, this is no outside Gentile critic who's trying to tear down what he doesn't possess. This is the insider of insiders talking. He can cite not only his, his Jewish lineage, but a pure lineage all the way back to the tribe of Benjamin. For those of you who have done family research, kind of looking into your family tree, you realize how hard it is to go back even a few hundred years in the modern era of the Internet. But Paul is able to trace his heritage back 1,500 years and not only that, he's able to trace it in spite of the fact the Babylonians came in, ravaged the entire Benjamin's heritage, their history, their culture, their records. He can still trace it, even in spite of that. It's a stunning claim. You see also here that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Most likely, most likely is a reference to this pure form of Judaism that he had inherited from his first day. Hebrews attended... Hebrews were those who attended synagogue in Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic in their home. They preserved the Jewish culture, as opposed to the Hellenized Jews who they still attended synagogue, but they were considered to be lesser Jews because they attended and they spoke Greek. And culturally, they blended more into this Gentile world. So he's as blue blood. He's as blue blood as there is. The Judaizers would have given their eye teeth to have his background. And no line that any of us could point to today can even compare to what he had received. So family background is a losing play. Here's where Paul's genius starts to shine a little bit. He anticipates that legalism is always going to shift the rules as needed. It's going to rewrite the entire game itself if that's what's necessary to paint itself in a better light. I'll change the entire game if it makes me look better. If I'm losing at this one, I'm going to switch to that one. And what we see is that we find his resume. He anticipates that, and his resume is already waiting on the other side. Look at how he shifts at the end of verse 5 and 6. He says, As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. If you want to skip over family, you want to talk about personal accomplishments, let's do that. And get this. He says, My attempts at personal righteousness were actually genuine efforts. I was sincere. You couldn't point to mine as self-serving, trying to promote myself. As far as I knew, from a human perspective, I looked blameless. And everything I did, I actually wanted to serve God. I actually wanted to serve God's cause. That's why he says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Theologian F.F. F. Bruce helps us understand why Paul thought this was actually, this way of persecuting the church was actually serving God. This is what he says. The law and the customs, the ancestral traditions, and everything that was of value in Judaism 
were imperiled by Jesus' disciples' activity and teaching. Here was a malignant growth which called for drastic surgery. The defense of all that made life worth living for Paul was a cause which engaged all the zeal and energy of which he was capable. When the chief priests and associates launched their attack on the disciples, Paul came forward as their eager lieutenant. Their motives may have, their motives may have been partly political, while his were entirely religious. So maybe you could have found fault with the Jewish leaders, but you couldn't have with Paul. Paul was sincere. He was as knowledgeable and as vigilant and as brilliant and a religious person as you're ever going to find. He had incredible theology. So no matter what level of criteria, no matter whatever, however we want to compare ourselves, that we're tempted to compare ourselves with others. That's what, that's what the Judaizers were doing. He says, whatever level you want to do that at, he's in essence challenging us to take those same rules and let him play that game with us. Take the same rules, let me in. If you feel good about holding out your record against others, let's come see how you really stack up. That's, how, that's the game you want to play. Pull out your list of accomplishments and I'm going to obliterate them. Whatever that thing is, whatever that thing is that causes you to look down, to play the comparison game, and to look down on somebody else, I can take that exact same measure. I can take that exact same measure, and I can make you look bad too. It's a brilliant argument. Legalism tempts us into believing that the comparison game is one that somehow, ultimately, in the end, we're going to win. And Paul just fillets that fallacy, that thinking wide open. He carries the comparison game all the way to the end. And he shows that even in comparing ourselves to others, we don't have nearly as much to offer as he does. But once he totally exposes, once he gets to the end of that, and he totally exposes it, he makes a shockingly wonderful confession. It wasn't even the right game. It doesn't even matter. Look what he says in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, now that is a small sentence that carries a lot of years, a lot of effort, a lot of suffering, a lot of religious activity. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. For the sake of Christ. The word that Paul uses for gain there is this Greek term, kerde. It referred to profit. It's the balance that's left over in your account after you subtract out all the expenses. And notice something really important here. He doesn't say that all those things, I used to count them. When I compared myself to other people, I used to count those things. That's not what he says. But now I've let those things go. That's, that's not what he says. He doesn't say, I used to count them, but now I'll let them go. Notice what he says. This is important. Notice that he still counts them. He still counts them. He's consciously aware of his own record. In fact, we just saw him rattle it off. But now, now he views that record of his attempt to justify himself, all those efforts, he views that record very differently. He purposely moves that seemingly massive pile of accomplishments entirely over into the lost ledger. He still counts them, but they're over here now. And he, he moves all of it. He doesn't leave, he doesn't hang on to a single shred of his own record or his own reputation. It's not there. He moves all of it over. All the impressive things that I just listed those are the things I now count as my shame. And they're my shame because those were the things that blinded me to my need for Jesus Christ. He realized that even in his sincere attempts to serve God, he actually was standing opposed to God. In the assessment of Christ, he was found to be lacking. And now that he sees he understands that's the only assessment that matters. It's the only true righteousness that actually exists. There is no other place of true righteousness. There is no other option 
of righteousness. It's in one place. It's in a person who earned it. Because the comparison game, it turned out to be a sham. And so he fully repents of his good works. Paul knows that Jesus Christ has achieved the only record that's ever going to please God. And you can't simultaneously be resting in his record while trying to establish your own. It's either or. They're mutually exclusive. And so he warns the Philippians, legalism isn't just a warped teaching out there. Certainly look out for that. But it's also buried deep in our warped hearts. It causes us to want to justify ourselves. You need to watch out for that form of legalism too. We desperately need to hear Paul's call echoing to us today. I think he would say the same thing. Listen, for me, Redemption Hill, to write the same things to you, it's no trouble to me. And I want you to know it, it's safe for you. It's safe for me to say these things to you, people who get the gospel. Maybe you've understood it for a long time. It's safe for you to hear this. So as we draw to a close, I want us to heed this warning. I want us to look at a couple of things to help us heed this warning because it is safety for us. Safety for us. First and foremost, if you're here today and you're partly trusting in your own works to be right before God, I would appeal to you, repent not only of your sin, but repent of your best intentions. Repent of your best efforts on your best day. If that's what you're leaning on to be right with God, repent of that. Call on the, fully on the name of Jesus Christ alone to save you. It's very possible to bear the name of Christian, to look the part for years, and still deep down be depending on your own record. Listen, God will not be mocked here. It's an atrocious thing to see Jesus on the cross. To hear him say, it is finished. And then put an asterisk with your name beside it. It's using the name of Jesus Christ to essentially spit on his sacrifice. Maybe it's somehow believing that since you grew up in a Christian home, God is going to count that as okay on the last day. St. Paul could trace his heritage all the way back to the very origin of God's people. And that's what made Jesus a stumbling block for him. Don't let that be the case for you. Maybe you're trusting somehow in your own efforts or intentions. Suddenly you think that by going to church and serving in ministry teams, serving on ministry teams, by not doing certain things, by parenting or protecting yourself from the world, guarding yourself from that, that in the end somehow there's going to be enough profit left in your account, and when you subtract out all the sin payments, because we're not perfect, but if we, we subtract all those out, that somehow if you compile those things together, that record together, somehow there's going to be a profit in the end that's going to be worth something. Listen, even things that are beneficial can be dangerous if we're depending on them at all, at all, to earn us a place in heaven. Listen, in the end, not only are those things going to be insufficient, they're going to count as our shame because those efforts, those exact efforts are going to turn out to be the things that kept us, the very things that kept us from throwing ourselves fully and entirely on Jesus Christ. And don't let the comparison game, don't let the comparison game lull you into a false sense of security. It wants to wrap its arm around you and say, you know what, it should be okay. Let Paul's argument expose that thinking for you. That's what it's there for. Let, it, let those verses, let his record expose that for you. It's a fool's errand, the comparison game. It's akin to winning, winning a game of checkers on the deck of the Titanic while it's sinking. What you desperately need is to run to the lifeboat. Don't stick around and win a game that's going to end up causing your destruction. Heed this warning from Paul. Repent of your good efforts. Repent of your best intentions. And cast yourself fully on the mercy of God that's freely and unreservedly offered to you in the gospel. Jesus stands ready to forgive you for trying to be good apart from him. And for rejecting his costly gift of salvation. Count your, 
Not somebody else's. Count your record. Move it over. Put it in the loss column. And rest in the record of another in your place. You can trust Jesus to save you fully. If you have any hesitancy of thinking, I, I, I need, is he really going to get me? Don't I need to add? Don't I need to do? You can trust. You can rest in that record. You can rest in his words that says it is finished. You, he is a savior that can save you to the uttermost. Don't ever doubt him. Don't ever doubt him by trying to add something. You can rest fully. You can stop your striving today and rest fully in Jesus. Second, we need to heed this warning by looking out for gospel plus teaching. A lot of gospel plus teaching is well-intentioned. It grows really genuinely out of a genuine desire to not abuse grace. But the Pharisees that Paul grew up under, that he cut his teeth under, were well-intentioned in their teaching. They even searched the Scriptures. Yet those seemingly good intentions are what caused them to miss Jesus and to look down on others. That was the fruit. So how can we see the difference? How do we know the difference between legalism, on the one hand, which looks very similar, it blends in, and the genuine obedience that Scripture certainly calls us to? That's requirement. Well, verse 3 equips us with three marks to be able to discern the difference, to be able to see the difference between the two and recognize it, between authentic Christianity and from legalism that's parading in its place. Verse 3 says, Those who are the true circumcision are those who worship God by the Spirit. In other words, they aren't attempting to serve God in their own strength. They aren't those out there trying to make their own way, using the name of Christ. They're, they're, instead, these are people who know that apart from God, apart from God, they don't have the ability to obey God. In their service, they're consciously and humbly depending on His Spirit. And they're, and they're calling others to do the same, to increasingly walk by the Spirit and depend on the life that God provides, not in our own strength. Those who are the true circumcision are those who glory in Christ Jesus. They love Him, and so they boast in the gospel. The thing that they most want you to know about their lives is not how great they are. The thing that they most want you to know about their lives is how wonderful Jesus is. I love one recent lyric which says, to tell you my story. To tell you my story. If you want to hear my story, it's to tell of him. That's what, that's what my story sounds like. It sounds like him. That's a mark. That's a mark of a true Christian. That's a difference to look for. And those who are the true circumcision are going to be at war against the legalism they are painfully aware of still in their own hearts. They're going to be at war against that because they have another desire in them now, a holy desire, a desire to battle against putting confidence in the flesh. Increasingly, when this legalistic tendency to compare begins to rear its ugly head and try to take over, they fight against that. They fight against it with all that they are. Because the authentic Christian knows that self-righteousness isn't this respectable misstep to be tolerated and allowed. Self-righteousness is an evil to continually forsake because it wars against Jesus Christ. If you want to be able to tell the difference between legalism and the true circumcision which God requires, look out for these marks. We even had Timothy and Epaphroditus, the mark of servanthood, versus these false teachers. These are the marks to be looking for. They define the true circumcision. Church, we know the gospel. We know what it is. We know the truths in it. We know the claims in it. We know the promises it makes. Like the Philippians, it's still safe for us to hear this twofold warning against legalism. It's always going to be at work, has been throughout church history. We'll continue all of our days. It will help your kids to think through this. Help them see this. It's going to try to blend in as best it can. It's going to try to make its way in as mimicry. But God in his kindness, God in his kindness reveals, he shines a light on it in this text. He clearly reveals it. 
so that we can see it for the danger that it is. Beware, beware the danger of legalism. Beware of it out there in false teaching as it comes. Beware of it in here. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, even the difficult things in your word are you being a loving father to us. Lord, if we've heard a word of correction today, if we've heard this warning as a warning for us personally, by the power of your spirit, Lord, I I pray that you would not allow us to resist that, to not give in to fear, but Lord, to look fully at Jesus. If there's anyone here today that may be resting on their own record, Lord, cause, a, cause that person, any of us, to look fully and completely on you and to rejoice, to experience what Luther described at his own conversion. For those of us who know you, Lord, protect us. Protect us from this game of comparison. Help us to be a people that increasingly glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Lord Jesus, for your name's sake, to you be the glory. In your name we pray. Amen.